Now to introduce our speaker, Jeff Halper. Jeff Halper is an Israeli anthropologist, a co-founder of the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, and the coordinator of the War Against the People Project of the People Yes Network. Jeff is on a five-week tour of the U.S. that focuses on the urgent need to articulate how the boycott movement cannot be effective unless it is tied to a political solution, which he puts forward as a single binational democratic state. The tour also focuses on his new book, War Against the People, Israel, the Palestinians, and Global Pacification, and how Israel is globalizing Palestine by exporting the occupation to us here in the U.S. in many ways, from military to surveillance to security to prison. <coughs> So please join me in welcoming Jeff Halpert. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you to all the sponsors. And what I'd like to do tonight is sort of two, two talks in one. And that is, um, uh, I mean, it's very interesting. I just wrote this book um, uh, on um, what I call uh, uh, Israel's globalizing of Palestine. How, in fact, it's exporting the occupation. Uh, and... Uh, it has less to do in some ways with Israel-Palestine. I mean, it uses Israel-Palestine as the vehicle, but it's really more intended to expose what I consider a tremendous blind spot on the, in the left, and that is our, we don't really deal with what Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex that we could call today the military-security-police-industrial complex. And, uh, and I wanted to use Israel-Palestine as a vehicle for us beginning to understand that world better. Um, but in my experience, uh, you know, as I go to all my friends around the world talking, um, I mean, some people are a little bit interested in that, but actually most people really want to hear, uh, you know, my thoughts on Israel-Palestine. So uh, the... the uh, the message I'm getting from a lot of places is, you know, your book is fine and it's kind of interesting, but we really want to hear about Israel-Palestine. So I'm, I'm sort of trying to combine the two to expand the discourse wider than Israel-Palestine, but at the same time, of course, since we're all activists together for the most part, uh, to try to uh, give my thoughts in terms of uh, where, where I think we should be headed in uh, dealing with the issue of Israel-Palestine. You know, I was the head of the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions. I'm still connected. I'm still in the family. I'm, I'm called the co-founder. Uh, and um, ICAD, as we call ourselves, has always from the very beginning uh, seen itself as a political actor. We don't want to merely protest or even resist or to document or to manage and believe me, we could have made millions of dollars by getting into humanitarian work. You know, there's so much money out there if you want to do dialogue groups, educational projects, documenting, uh, and, uh, and even human rights work. I mean, the human rights work has largely been depoliticized in Israel-Palestine. Uh, but we always wanted to keep our political focus, that our job is to is to end the Israeli occupation completely and totally and achieve with our Palestinian partners a just peace. So we've always seen ourselves as actors. We're trying to, uh, we're trying to uh, work with civil society all over the world, but we're also working with governments. You know, I go to foreign ministries, I go to the State Department, we meet parliamentarians and Congress people, and so on. We don't, we, uh, we don't put much stake in that, but, but we don't leave any stone unturned, let's say. And so, you know, like it was said at the, in the introduction, uh, I think one of the uh, weaknesses, well, not one of the weak, the weakness of, uh, of where we are in our campaigning is the lack of an end game. In other words, uh, you can't be, in my view, in a political struggle unless you tell people where you're going. What, what do you want? And I think we've gotten to a point in this struggle where we've mobilized, by we I mean all the Palestinian and critical Israeli organizations, and you, 
you know, JVP and all the, the Brooklyn, I, I mean, all the, uh, you know, all the sponsors tonight and many, I mean, there's thousands, literally, of organizations around the world that have made Palestine, in my view, a global movement. I think the Palestinian issue has achieved the, the, um, the, the stature, let's say, of the anti-apartheid movement all over the world. Uh, so that we've been mobilized, and, and I don't think Israel is in as strong a position as it seems. I think Israel's losing it a lot, but what we need now is that final push to say, well, where are we going? What do we want to replace the occupation with? And to some degree, I have a feeling that we're leaving people hanging. And I mean, this has to be led by Palestinians and articulated by Palestinians, supported by uh, critical Israelis like us, and then, of course, supported by uh, uh, people abroad like you. So what I'd like to do is just kind of share some ideas in terms of where I think we, should, we could be headed. And these are just ideas because, uh, again, I don't have the, uh, um, you know, I can't tell the Palestinians where to go. But I think in this, at this time when we're all kind of stuck and when we have to begin to think forward, I'm trying as much as I can to introduce ideas and kind of get the juices flowing that will lead us towards thinking about where in fact are we headed in Israel-Palestine. <clears throat> so I'll start <coughs> somewhere that we're fairly familiar with and go into some areas um, uh, that, that I think we're less familiar with, some ideas, and then segue a little bit into global Palestine, which is what my book is about. So basically, as we, as we know, they're actually, you know, and I try to emphasize to people when I'm speaking, including a, a, a members of Congress, the day before yesterday I spoke to the Massachusetts State Legislature in Boston. Uh, and of course, then you have to couch this in terms of American interests. I mean, they're less concerned about Palestinian human rights. But one point I think that we have to make is that, you know, this is a global conflict. And, you know, people like Dershowitz and other pro-Israeli spokespeople always say, well, why is the world preoccupied with, with Israel? Why does the UN pass so many resolutions? It's got to be anti-Semitic. You know, they're not looking at China and Tibet. They're not looking at the Congo. They're not looking at Mexican drug cartels. They're all, everybody's looking at Israel. Um, and there's something to that, that Israel certainly, the Israel-Palestine conflict certainly does take a disproportionate amount of our attention. But I think the reason is because it disrupts the entire international system. It's not simply a spat between two local peoples living in some corner of the world. And even though I have always thought that the Congo, in its scale and its violence, is a much worse conflict. I mean, you can't really compare conflicts. But in, in, in those senses, it's much worse. Nevertheless, the Congo doesn't disrupt the international system the way that this conflict does, of course, located in the Middle East which is such an important geopolitical part of the world, with all the energy resources uh, involved, and still reeling from the colonial period. So the instability and the conflicts and the resistance to Western, global North American, neo-imperialism, neo-colonialism radiates out, of course. I mean, you can't get on an airplane here with a tube of toothpaste. So obviously, there are very strong connections between security and I would argue, and I'll argue it in, a, in a little bit, even the, the, the beginning transformation of the United States from, from a democracy into what's known as a security state, in which security trumps democracy completely, has to do with, has to, do with uh, to, to a large degree, this conflict in the Middle East. And in this sense, uh, I think Kerry, Kerry uh, uh, John Kerry, who I don't always agree with, <laughs> was, was right when he said, you know, the Israel-Palestine conflict isn't the cause, of course, of all the other conflicts in the Middle East. Nevertheless, 
it's an aggravating, always aggravating influence. You know, it's, uh, it's a militarism. Just two weeks ago, President Obama signed a bill giving $40 billion in new arms to Israel over a 10-year period. This is a country the size of New Jersey. Uh, and that's on top of $30 billion that Bush gave Israel in 2008. So over a 20-year period, between 2008 and 2028, Israel's getting $70 billion in cutting-edge American weaponry. Not to mention Saudi Arabia, that's the largest consumer of American arms. Egypt, which gets about $3 billion in arms a year, and is not exactly the most human rights-oriented country either. The Gulf states, and so on and so on and so on. So that this really introduces militarism and polarization and alienation and resistance. And I would argue that the Palestinians have become emblematic in the world of the global south, in the world of oppressed peoples, including the global south here within the global north. Uh, you know, Ferguson is a perfect example. When Ferguson broke out, um, as you know, uh, people in Gaza were SMSing to the people of Ferguson how to deal with tear gas, how to deal with police brutality, how to deal with the Israeli weapons that the uh, police are using. So that kind of a solidarity is, is there. And to the degree that the Palestinians are emblematic of oppressed peoples everywhere, it super isolates the United States and the world. In other words, this, the, the, the occupation, I would, I would submit, in Europe, as well as the rest of the world, is not seen as an Israeli occupation, but is seen as an American Israeli occupation. It's clear that it couldn't be sustained for a month without the financial, military, political support that the United States gives Israel, and uh, Hillary Clinton at the lead, <laughs> which is something that we're going to have to deal with. Um, so that this has tremendous implications, resolving this conflict, not only for the Middle East itself, and not only for the United States, but I think in terms of, of trying to get to a more just relationship between the global north and the global south overall. So this really, and there's a lot riding on this. You know, uh, um, you know, we don't live in Hollywood no matter what Reagan thought. And the good guys don't always win. So here is probably the challenge, I would say, in the world to the whole notion of human rights and international law that are really the, uh, you know, most oppressed peoples in the world just have a finger grip on something a little bit better, some justice, some parity, because of the hope that human rights and international law hold out. And so that if, in fact, Israel wins and an entire people are permanently imprisoned, and that could well happen. In fact, as I'll say, Israel thinks it has happened. Israel believes it has won with the help of the United States. And human rights and international law and justice are defeated. And power and militarism take over and win, whoa, that sets us all back to square one. I mean, the chilling message to peoples all over the world uh, you know, can't, be, can't be exaggerated. I mean, this is a conflict that goes on. Uh, it's probably the most documented conflict in the world. It isn't hidden in the Congo or Vietnam or the jungles of Colombia. It's on the southern border of Europe. It's in the Holy Land, no less. And if, if the forces of militarism and racism and domination prevail, I mean, it, 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 it impacts in a fundamental way on all our struggles everywhere. So there's a lot riding on how this conflict is resolved. For all of that, the conflict has or had a fairly simple, straightforward solution. 
And that's, of course, the two-state solution. This was a, a, the solution accepted by the international community in 1967, almost 50 years ago. It's the solution that until today, on paper at least, is the American position, which says basically two states for two peoples. This is one integral country. The Jews call it the land of Israel. The Palestinians call it Palestine. Religious people call it the Holy Land. Whatever you call it, it's one integral country. And in this one country between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River live two peoples. Whether there should be two peoples or shouldn't be is another issue. But there are, in a political, sociological sense. Palestinian Arabs and Israeli Jews. So the idea of a two-state solution, of course, is partition. Let's divide the country between them into two states. I mean, that sounds OK on paper. When you look at the actual map, of course, it's not exactly a fair and just division of the country. Because in the two-state solution, Israel remains on 78% of the country. 78% of historical Palestine remains Israel. And if the Palestinians got every square inch of the occupied territory for a state of their own, that only constitute, as you know, 22% of historic Palestine. In other words, the West Bank, East Jerusalem with the Old City, and Gaza. So that, and nevertheless, you talk about generous offers, the Palestinians, the PLO, accepted the two-state solution in 1988, publicly, close to 30 years ago. Arafat and the PLO, when it really represented all the Palestinians, accepted the two-state solution. Now, this is unprecedented in history, in my view, that a colonized people gave up political claim to 78% of their country. When has that ever happened? In order to have peace. And if Israel, in fact, really wanted peace and security and integration into the Middle East, it could have had that 30 years ago and 78% of the country with the agreement of the Palestinians. I mean, what can be more pro-Israel than that? And the offer was even more generous on the part of the PLO and Arafat because in this country today, half the population is Palestinian. Today, even before any of the five million refugees living around return. And in five years, regardless of the refugees, there will be a Palestinian majority in this country. So that, in, in effect, the Palestinian majority and a colonized indigenous people said to the Israeli Jews, we will make peace with you and integrate you into the region if you allow us to establish a state on less than a quarter of the land. And this offer was then reaffirmed in 2002 by the entire Arab League, unanimously in what's called the Saudi Peace Initiative, formulated by no less than Saudi Arabia. So here we have a kind of a Saudi-Israeli access beginning to, uh, beginning to develop. So that the international community, the United States, the Palestinians, the Arab League, almost across the board said, we can live with this solution. The Palestinians could make a goal of this small state. And that's the offer to Israel. And the only, out, the only of course, uh, uh, um, the only holdout to this offer was Israel that said no. Israel said no. Uh, even in the brightest days of Oslo, uh, th there was never a two-state solution that was even I think mildly entertained. Israel never, ever, ever genuinely negotiated with the Palestinians. And in fact, Israel never recognized the existence of the Palestinian people until today. In Oslo, all it did in Oslo, 
was to recognize the PLO as a negotiating partner. But there was no end game to Oslo, and that was, of course, the fatal flaw. It wasn't going towards anything. And, uh, and so <clears throat> in Oslo, of course, Israel continued imposing what I call a matrix of control over the occupied territory. So if you, you know, I'm an anthropologist. An anthropologists approach the world from the ground up. If I have to listen to what politicians are saying and what they're really doing, if I want to read their intentions, I look at what they're doing on the ground. And if you look at what Israel has done, and every government, Labour, Likud, uh, Kadima, whatever the government was, it was the same relentless, unending process of, of eliminating the two-state solution in a very systematic way and deliberately. This wasn't an accident. In order to incorporate uh, uh, the West Bank and, West and East Jerusalem into Israel itself. Gaza is a cage. Israel doesn't want it. It's got two million Palestinians almost, no water, no resources. I mean, it's a, it's a disaster. And it's trying to sh shove it back onto Egypt that doesn't want it. So Gaza has been sort of excised from the map. But what Israel does want, of course, is the West Bank. We don't call it the West Bank in Israel. We call it Judea and Samaria by its biblical name. Israel has always uh, rejected the idea that there even is an occupation. And it's very clever at its legal manipulations. Uh, Israel claims... There's a principle, if you want a, a fancy legal term, the principle of the missing reversionary, which means that, and, and, the, and no legal expert, no country has ever accepted this argument, but it's enough to gum up the works, where Israel says, well, what's occupation? Occupation is when one sovereign state conquers and occupies the territory of another sovereign state. And since the Palestinians never had sovereignty, there's no one that we can return the land to. There's a missing reversionary, you see? And therefore, our claim is just as good as anybody else's. And the Palestinians really have no stake. Jordan and Egypt have more of a status in terms of negotiating with Israel than the Palestinians do. So that Israel has always denied there's an occupation. And then, of course, on the ground, has done everything possible to eliminate the two-state solution. I won't get into all of this tonight, but of course, uh, the Palestinian territory has been fragmented into what are called areas A and B, for those of you that have been there. Um, these brown, darker and lighter uh, brown areas that are 40% of the West Bank, but fragmented into about 70 little islands into which about 90% of the Palestinians have been pushed and are confined. They're literally cells in a prison. And then, of course, in Area C, which is the 62% of the West Bank that surrounds all these cells, that's where Israel, which is under full Israeli control, that's where Israel has built these blue dots, the settlements, 200 settlements, more than 600,000 Israelis living in the occupied territory. And in fact, in four years, according to the Israeli construction plans, there'll be 600,000, there'll be a, a million Israelis living in the occupied territory. And just to show you how Israel frames it, today in the New York Times, I don't know if you saw it, there was a letter from Ron Dermer, who's the Israeli ambassador to Washington. Even that's weird. Because, you know, Ron Dermer was, uh, was, uh, was uh, Romney's, one of Romney's campaign managers. So you take an American Republican and send him to be the ambassador in Washington, it's a clear snub, a clear kind of a humiliation to the Obama administration. And Dermer writes today, and, and Obama isn't going to meet Netanyahu, and Netanyahu was going to come to the APAC meeting, and then he canceled because Obama wouldn't meet him. And so Dermer is trying to defend Netanyahu in today's New York Times. And he writes that uh, Netanyahu is the only prime minister 
who never built new settlements. Well, that sounds great. And it's true in the sense that, yes, he didn't establish new settlements because you got 200 of them already. You don't need new settlements. But what he's done, of course, is build tens of thousands of housing units that expand the existing settlements. But if you don't know that, it sounds great to the readers of the New York Times that here Netanyahu the liberal did not expand, uh, did not expand the settlements in terms of numbers. So it's all, you've got to know the map if you want to be able to get people to understand the dynamics beyond uh, uh, you know, the, the, the superficial kinds of uh, slogans that they sell. So the land's been fragmented. Uh, the settlements have been built in a way, and then, of course, connected to Israel with a whole matrix of highways, Israeli highways, that then connect and incorporate the West Bank into Israel proper. So that the whole idea of a two-state solution is based on a north-south axis that here's Israel and alongside of it is a Palestinian state. So in order to break that and to really eliminate the two-state solution, Israel built east-west. See a major highway here, the Ariel settlement leading to the Jordan Valley, the whole greater Jerusalem area with its highways so that there is no more coherent territory, but there's also no area alongside Israel that could be detached and made into a Palestinian state. One of the terms that we're urging on people, because it's a term that's not so well known, is the term Judaization. And that's a term that on the surface sounds a little bit anti-Semitic, but it's a term that the Zionist movement has used for a hundred years and the Israeli government uses officially. We're Judaizing the Galilee, we're Judaizing Jerusalem, and we're Judaizing the entire country. And I would submit that after 100 years of Judaization, and after 50 years of the Judaization of this little territory of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, not Gaza, but, but the West Bank and East Jerusalem, that that's been completed. I would argue that there is no more occupation. That in fact the West Bank has been turned into Judea and Samaria. That the Palestinians live in cells today. Now, occupation is defined in international law as a temporary military situation. After 50 years and 600,000 Israelis and the complete fragmentation and imprisonment of the Palestinians, it's hard to talk anymore about occupation. So when we say, and this is something we have to think about, if one of the basic elements of BDS is to end the occupation, and we're not going to end the occupation. In fact, Israel ended the occupation by Judaizing and incorporating Judea and Samaria irreversibly into Israel, then we've got to rethink uh, some fundamental things. So that, so that uh, us, and then if you still didn't get the message, <laughs> somehow you're still J Street, and you still think the two-state solution is, is, is possible, despite what Israel is telling you and beating you over the head with, we built a wall <laughs> just to kind of make the point. So it's a wall, of course, as you know, uh, sold for security reasons, but you just have to look at the map to see security has nothing to do with it. It's a wall more than twice as high as the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall was 12 feet high. If you go to Checkpoint Charlie in East Berlin, what was East Berlin, it's a, it's a little wall, 12 feet high. The Israeli wall is 26 feet high, and it's five times longer. And it's not linear like the Berlin Wall was, but it encompasses tens of thousands of Palestinians into cells. And of course, the wall has two purposes. One is to define in concrete what Israel calls the cantons, within which the Palestinians will be confined. In the north, in the center of the West Bank, in the south, and then of course Gaza. And on the other side, of course, to incorporate these pink areas, you see the pink areas around the blue areas are what Israel calls its settlement blocks, where it's consolidating its settlements 
So the wall actually conforms fairly much to the settlement blocks and incorporates them in Israel, including a greater Jerusalem. If you just look at the, you can't tell me the wall comes out to here for security reasons. It's clear that this has uh, other functions. So where are we then? <clears throat> it seems to me, if we want to resolve this, it seems to me there's, there's three possible resolutions to this conflict. Mathematically, I'm an anthropologist, so mathematics isn't my strong suit. Um, there's actually five options, two of which I'm going to eliminate. One is we throw all the Jews into the sea, and the other, and, and the other one is we throw all the Arabs into the sea, both of which have advocates in Israel-Palestine. But I think we can eliminate those, which leaves three. One of them is the two-state solution. And that could have worked. We were never against the two-state solution in the Israeli peace movement. If the Palestinians accepted it, who am I to say no? So that we supported for years the two-state. I remember up till four or five years ago writing articles warning that we're in the bottom of the ninth, that the two-state solution is disappearing. I wrote an article, if the roadmap doesn't succeed, the whole thing is lost. I mean, we held on as well to the two-state solution. It wasn't only J Street that did that. But at some point, at some point, you have to, you have to really recognize the realities on the ground and the wider political realities. Three of them in particular. One are the facts on the ground that eliminate physically the possibility. Of, there is no more coherent territory where a Palestinian state could emerge including East Jerusalem, which is also gone. There is no more East Jerusalem. That was incorporated into Israel 50 years ago, and there are today more Israelis in East Jerusalem than there are Palestinians. So that's gone. The second reason is because Israel says it's gone. I mean, J Street can say anything it wants, but the Israeli government says there's no two-state solution, period. So that, uh, you know, who are you going to argue with? Uh, argue with the Israeli, that's their policy. And the third element, of course, is that the will in the international community to force Israel out to a point where a Palestinian state could emerge is completely missing. There is no international will. And, and Israel, for Israel, the world is reduced to two actors. One is the American Congress, not the administration, Congress which has wall-to-wall, -wall, both party, both house support. And the other is Germany, that keeps Europe in, in line. You have those two actors, and you can thumb your nose at the international community. So you've got this strange situation where, with all our work together, we have really moved public opinion. I think public opinion in the world has shifted, even in this country, to a certain degree, towards the Palestinians, or at least critical of Israel. Nobody buys, hardly anybody buys, maybe AIPAC, but hardly any, and they have a tough sell. Hardly anybody buys the Israeli line anymore, but, uh, but governments continue to support Israel. There's a disconnect, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So with that then, the two-state solution could have worked, but it's gone. I mean, I would say for reasons, and I can go on for another hour and a half on why, it's gone. It's dead. It's over. And we should stop talking about it. Because the more you talk about a solution that's irrelevant, the more you're simply muddying the waters. So I would eliminate that option, which leads us to option two in terms of resolving this. And that is what we have today. Apartheid. In other words... Israel believes that what we have today, which is an apartheid regime, is sustainable. Certainly if we have American and German support, then wider support. That, that, and this is where that military part, the security politics, the globalizing of Palestine comes into play. That I'll talk about in a minute. So Israel feels that it's won. It's over. We've... we've uh, eliminated the Palestinians as a, uh, as a force. 
On the contrary, we even have set up the Palestinian Authority, which is our policeman. So the Palestinians say we're living under two occupations. Um, and uh, there's no more place for a Palestinian state. And more or less, the world has gone on and will allow that to happen. You know, when Netanyahu used to announce 2,000 housing units in the West Bank, Secretary of State Clinton would say, that's unhelpful. Today, the United States doesn't react at all. It's simply, it, it's gone by the boards, pretty much. And as you know, in his last address to the UN, Obama didn't even mention Israel-Palestine. So the idea in Israel is the world will go on to the Syrian refugees, to the wars, to uh, Ukraine, to China, to West Africa, to all the other issues. And if we can just make this quiet with the help of the Palestinian Authority collaborators, the world will simply go on and we can sustain this indefinitely. And in fact, I would argue that the situation is worse than apartheid. Apartheid in international law can simply be defined by two elements, separation, which is what apartheid means, separateness, one population separating itself from the others, and domination. When that population creates a regime, it's not just discrimination, but a regime of permanent institutionalized domination. And that's certainly what we have here. But I would just suggest that there's a situation worse than apartheid, and that's warehousing which is a term that's come out of the American prison system. Angela Davis has popularized that term among others. And that is that this, the Palestinian people are being warehoused, are being imprisoned. It's hard to say a good thing about apartheid. <laughs> but at least under apartheid, even though it was fakey and bullshitty and not true, nevertheless, the idea was separate development. There was a recognition that there were black Africans that existed as a people. And Bantu sands were supposed to be homelands. Even that pretense is lacking here. Israel said there's no Palestinian people. They have no national rights. They have no claims to this country. Uh, and uh, and, and we're, we're going to simply imprison them. They're inmates. Now, the back door is open in this prison. They can leave through Jordan or through Egypt and go wherever they want to go, but otherwise they're simply being imprisoned. That's it, period. It's over. And that's, I think, the message of Gaza last year when the Kerry Initiative failed. It was immediately followed by a military operation in the West Bank called Operation Brothers Keeper, immediately followed by the attack on Gaza, Operation Protective Edge, leading into what we have today, which are mopping up operations. So option two, and this is what should worry us, is apartheid warehousing that Israel believes it can sustain with the help of the United States. I don't think it, I, 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 well, I mean, partly for wishful thinking, but partly because I'm an activist, I don't think we can allow that to happen. A new apartheid state in the world in which the Jews, which is pretty chilling, become the Afrikaners. So that we certainly can't accept that. Which seems to me to leave one option left. I mean, it seems to me fairly clear. but uh, And that is, if the two-state solution is gone and apartheid warehousing is not acceptable, the third option is to say to Israel, Okay, you eliminated the two-state solution. Don't blame the Arabs for that. So you eliminated, in that way, the possibility of Israel being a Jewish state. Don't blame the Arabs for that. That was, if you, in your terms, that was the ultimate anti-Zionist act. But you did it. Okay, you created one state. There is one state today. I mean, this whole argument, two states, one state, is over. There is one state between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. There's only one effective government, not including the PA. Obviously, there's only one army. There's only one electrical system, one water system, one highway system, uh, one currency. By any measure, this is already one functioning state. 
So we say to Israel, fine, we accept that. Matter of fact, the Palestinians always wanted a single state. We accept that, what you did, but it can't be an apartheid state. It has to be a democratic state of equal rights for all its citizens. We shouldn't be such a revolutionary sell to Americans. Oh, democracy, why didn't we think of that? So that seems to me where we're going. And until now, I think most Palestinians would, would accept that. And so we have to complicate it, of course. Um, and, and that is, I think, one democratic state of equal rights for all the citizens is absolutely the basis. With one proviso, it's not a proviso, with an additional element, and that is binationalism. I mean, this isn't Kansas. We just have a bunch of voters. You're talking about a country comprised largely of two national groups that have always, for the last century, been fighting for national rights, national identity, Palestinian Arabs and Israeli Jews. And that's the reality. And you can't uh, uh, sweep it under the rug. That has to be, I think, accepted. The idea of binationalism simply says in a constitution that Israel doesn't have today, we accept also the existence, the collective rights. We recognize the collective rights of Israelis and Palestinians, and we accept, um, we guarantee the integrity of each cultural group within one democratic state. And there's other states like that. You have Canada that does that. The Francophiles and the Anglophiles. Britain has four national groups within one democratic state, and the Scots are probably more nationalistic than the Palestinians are. And yet they decided, narrowly, but they decided to remain within one democratic Britain. Spain, we'll see where the Catalonians go, but in other words, there are countries, and they have their tensions, which is true, but they function. So that I would say, and then I've been playing with what that would look like just in, in, a, in a word. And one of the words, if you want to leave with one thing tonight, I'll leave you with a fancy academic term. That's consociational, which basically means sharing. Unlike Lebanon, which is based on division, this is based on sharing. And there's two principles I'll just mention. One is it would be a very, like Switzerland, a very weak federal government or national government. In other words, in Switzerland, of course, historically, the cantons had stronger identities than some pan-Swiss identity. You, you lived, you were a German speaker, an Italian speaker, a French speaker, and so, <clears throat> you know, when I'm in Germany, well, when I'm in Germany, which borders Switzerland, nobody can tell me who the prime minister of Switzerland is. Can anybody here tell me who the prime minister is in Switzerland? And I'll tell you a secret. They don't have a prime minister. They have a president. <laughs> and they have seven presidents because they rotate in the cantonial system. So it's a good example of how you can have a functioning multinational country that doesn't have an agreed upon art, you know, a, a, a overall identity. But can, but can run in a technocratic way. And that's what I would, I would suggest, a kind of a technocratic government because the real identities of the people devolve down into these areas. So I would suggest, just, as, uh, just to throw this out, just to kind of get the juices going, a parliament with two houses where in every election you get two votes. And I actually took this idea from New Zealand where the Maori are considered a people, a, a nation, with a treaty, and they have two votes in every election. They vote for the national parliament, but also for Maori parties. So here you would have, again, a democracy, a normal democracy with a parliament elected by citizens. But there would be a second house of parliament that's more communal, where you would vote, if you're an Israeli Jew, you would vote within this your community, for your parties, your candidate, whatever, and Palestinian Arabs would do the same, 
And these communal representatives who go into another house of parliament, not with equal power, of course, the, the power resides with the parliament, but with a kind of a veto power. So because, especially for Israeli Jews, of course, who will be the minority, their fear is the tyranny of the majority. What if the Palestinians do to us what we're doing to them today? <laughs> you know, Israel is disenfranchising the Palestinian community today in Israel. A law is going through the parliament in Israel today. It's past the first reading of three that says, if you don't sign a document declaring loyalty to Israel, as a Jewish democracy, you can't run for office, which is going to eliminate all Palestinian representation in the parliament. Well, so the fear of Israelis, of course, is that they'll do the same thing to us when they get in power. So what this binational component does is it adds a level of protection, that the, the integrity of each national group is assured and guaranteed uh, by the state, so that if parliament passes a law uh, violating the integrity of either one of these communities, this house of parliament kind of has a veto power to say no, that's unconstitutional, that goes against the agreement. And if that, w and I'll tell you why it's important in one sentence, um, <clears throat> well, partly why it's important. For Israeli Jews, I think Israeli Jews aren't as right-wing as we think they are. 85% supported the Oslo peace process uh, 20 years ago. Um, they've never been presented with an alternative to terrorism and what we have, you know, what the government presents today. But the good news is that, you know, even if you take 600,000 settlers, that's less than 10% of the Israeli population after all these years. And in fact, the real settlers, the ideological ones, the religious ones that think God gave us this land and, and, and are violent towards Palestinians, are 1% of the Israeli population. That's it. So that, so that I think a good third of the Israeli population is right wing in an ideological sense. But nevertheless, for the vast majority of Israeli Jews, the issue is security and not land. They never bought into the greater land of Israel idea. And so I think if you can address, first of all, your, your individual rights are protected in a normal democracy, but your collective rights as a national group are also recognized and protected within this state, that would go a long way towards addressing those fears of Israeli Jews and I think they could go further with this kind of a model than we think.